Welcome again to another series in CPD in 43. Today we have Peter Apps uh, from Insider Housing, um, who is a published author um, of a book regarding uh, Grenfell, how we let Gren Grenfell happen. Um, really um, privileged to have him here today, um, really pertinent topic um, and also obviously a national tragedy. Um, and it's something that has caused Uh, society within the UK on how you know, we use housing, deliver housing and so on. So I'm really interested to hear um, uh, from him. And as usual, um, I encourage you to uh, post questions within the chat box. Um, those will be fielded towards the end of the talk as normal uh, as part of our Q&A session. And uh, just for everyone's peace of mind, this will be uploaded to our YouTube uh, channel uh shortly afterwards and the president presentation slides will also be made available to those who have registered via eventbrite um so without further ado i'll hand it over to peter um i will then i will obviously disappear into the background and I'll be back during the q a session thank you um Usman. thank you for the invite to to speak here today and thank you everyone for for coming along to listen to me uh speak virtually um as 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 said in the introduction um i'm i'm p apps i'm a deputy editor at inside housing magazine um hopefully some of you have come across this before in your travels but um basically we with a trade publication a sort of architects journal type publication for the social housing sector um so for registered providers of social housing local authorities and so on um Obviously, as a result of that, Grenfell um, happening in in a, in a social housing block um, made it a, a huge story for our readers and for us. Um, and as a result, um, we we picked up the, the the coverage of that story and have stayed with it um, over the six years since. Um, we'd actually been writing a little bit about cladding safety and fire safety and high rises before the fire happened as well. Um, so I've written a book, um, eventually sort of bringing together all of that reporting, um, some of the, the 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 interviews I did with people in the community, all, all of that kind of thing. So tell tell the story of the fire to a a wider audience and and why it happened and this really kind of terrible story of miswarnings and 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 uh, avoidable failures that the that piled up in a long train to to get us to the the, the state that we found ourselves in and in June 2017, where a building could be as dangerous as, as Grenfell Tower proved to be. Um, today, I'm going to focus on architects uh, because that is what most of you are um, and what the role of architects was in, in, in this story and what lessons maybe we could take from that about how to avoid similar issues coming coming around again. Um, so uh, as has been said at the start, we've got... Um, I've got a presentation which is going to be shared um, with attendees at the end. Um, so I'll just bring it up now on screen. Right, so Grenfell Tower Inquiry and Architects. I've called my presentation Horse Meat and Lasagna, um, which uh, hopefully will become clear uh, why I've called it that as we go along. Some of you who followed the inquiry will probably already be familiar with that quote. Um, the um, just to kind of set the scene in terms of where we are um, and what's happened, because it's been it's been a lengthy process, um, which is it's been very easy to lose track of. Um, the, the 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 huge public inquiry into the fire is 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 now um, finished. It's it's at least finished. It's it's evidence hearing process. Um, it was split into two phases. One looked at the the the, the kind of minute by minute detail of what happened on the night. Um, and that sort of took us through a lot of evidence from firefighters, a lot of evidence from residents and survivors, just to build up a picture of exactly the course of events um, that happened over the course of the night. Um, and th that first phase um, made a number of quite significant findings from a kind of building safety perspective. Um, the most crucial of those was that the primary cause of the external fire spread was the polyethylene inside the aluminium composite material cladding on the external wall of the building. Um, and just kind of, I know there's some technical language in there, which most of you will probably be familiar with, but um, it was a rain screen cladding system at Grenfell, 
you had insulation rendered directly to the external wall. You had a small cavity in between, and then you had uh, a, an external sheet of um, of ACM aluminium composite material cladding, which is two very thin sheets of aluminium bonded together with polyethylene. Polyethylene is the same plastic that we use in plastic bags, um, in you know all, all, all kinds of uses. It, it is chemically similar to the the, the petrol that we put in in car engines um, and as such is extraordinarily flammable and it ignites at quite a low temperature. Um, so there has been, it sort of seems obvious that that plastic was the cause of the fire shooting up the building, um, or, but there's been some confusion about that. Um, some people talk about the the sort of chimney effect of the cavity and the um, uh, other things around the, the physics of a rain screen cladding system, but primarily it was that, it was that, um, that highly combustible plastic fixed to the outside walls that led to fire shooting up from the fourth floor to the to the 24th in 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 such devastating fashion um and so the second phase of of the inquiry which ran over two years uh and and finished with kind of concluding statements last november took a broad sweeping look at, at, at the question how did grenfell come to be in the state it was in um on june the 14th 2017 and that that took us across the 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 construction job which refurbished the tower um, over a two year process in the 2010s. Um, it took us uh, through the the construction products industry and the way the products were certified and sold uh, for use on the tower. Um, it took us through the social housing management of the building, the aftermath of the fire, uh, the 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 response of the London Fire Brigade and the London Fire Brigade's prepared preparedness for the event. And finally, and, and crucially, I think it looked also at central government and, and the, the, the reasons why we didn't necessarily have good enough regulations um, to ensure that the buildings were safe um, and, and, and still don't actually um, in many ways, which we might come on to. Um, so focusing in on the architects, uh, the architectural firm was, was a, a, a London based practice called Studio E. Um, they were appointed to do this recladding job out of little more than convenience, really. Um, the, the the history to the tower being refurbished is quite long, but it, it, in short terms, a school was being built and an academy and leisure centre project was being built at the base of the tower. Um, RBKC was the local, local authority, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, um, was facing some pushback from the residents of the tower who were sort of saying, look, you're taking away our green space to build a school, but we're not getting anything in return. You know, we're, we're living in a tower block that's had no refurbishment work for 40 years. So sort of as a response to that criticism, um, the council decided to uh, add some refurbishment work for the tower onto their existing school project. And Studio E ended up getting the job. They were specialists in building schools and, and managing those kind of projects. They'd never done tower block refurbishment, particularly not what was actually an extraordinarily complicated tower block refurbishment, which needed to be done with the residents staying in their homes um, to a, to a, an already built building that was complicated from a from a building management, from a fire safety perspective. This engaged a lot of really difficult issues um, that they were not specialist in. Um, the internal emails described them as um, being quote unquote a little green on process and technicality um, and, and needing to get up to speed quickly in order to do the work. Um, nonetheless, they still took it. And uh, this job, which should have been subject to public procurement to find the, the most appropriate firm, um, that public procurement process was deliberately avoided due to an agreement between Studio E and the, the building managers to split the, 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 the project fee in half so that it didn't cross the threshold for public procurement. Um, so the, the job was given inappropriately to to affirm that that um, certainly with hindsight were not um, suitably expert in the work that they were doing. Um, it also had kind of a bad um, intention from the outset. Uh, th there wasn't um, the, the, the the purpose of this project was not how do we make this building as good as it possibly can be for the people that live there. It was also, how do we make it look nice? Um, Grenfell was an, an old building. Um, it hadn't been very well looked after by the council. It was made of concrete. It was starting to look worn down from the outside. 
and that was something the council didn't like. Um, the internal emails said that part of the project would be preventing it looking like a poor cousin to the brand new facility being developed next door. There was also talk of it being a quote unquote blight on the surrounding area and, um, uh, you know, not not being particularly nice to look at from the kind of more wealthy conservation areas that, that um, exist next to the council estate. Um, and so this idea of aesthetics and kind of giving the building a facelift um, were there from the, from from the outset and um, arguably, as we'll see, had had some quite serious consequences down the line. Um, the, the the two architects who who were primarily in charge of of, of doing the drawings and, and and overseeing this project were a guy called Bruce Soans, who's um, pictured there, and um, his colleague Neil Crawford. Um, uh, Neil Crawford, incidentally, um, was an architect by training, but his his professional qualification had lapsed. Um, so at the time of this refurbishment job, he was actually unable to use architect as a professional um, title. Um, nonetheless, he was still working on projects, still employed by Studio E, still doing um, what the um, uh, what the effectively fulfilling on this project, the role of an architect. Um, for, for both of them, it was their first residential cladding job. But despite it being their first residential cladding job, at no point did they sit down and check the rules, whether that's the kind of overriding statutory requirement that a building must uh, adequately resist the spread of flame or the kind of more technical government guidance that sets specific standards and specific rules. They simply believed, they told the inquiry, that subcontractors, specialists, fire consultants and ultimately building control would ensure that whatever they designed was compliant, um, which is a pretty extraordinary thing to me that, that you would risk that putting designs together that the, the <laughs> building control might throw out later on down the line. But um, according to, to, to Bruce and Neil, that wasn't an unusual way of working for them. Um, they were they were happy to to, to leave um, in the domain of other experts the, the the issue of compliance rather than taking responsibility for it themselves. And they didn't get their head around key concepts like limited combustibility, um, class zero, um, and what those really meant in practice and what the risks of them were. They shouldn't have been using plastic insulation, for example, on a building of this height. Um, but they were unaware that the phrase limited combustibility would have ruled out any sort of plastic. Um, so uh, the, the, their view was that um, they um, they were just there to provide what they called architectural intent. So make sure the designs looked like the um, the the the, the uh, aesthetic style that the the client wanted. And and beyond that, they they said that they didn't really have any role in um, in making sure that they were safe um, and compliant. Um, they were also, and it is it is very fair and important to say this, that they, they, there were specialist fire engineers on the project. Um, a very well-respected international consultancy called Exova um, was commissioned to look at the um, the plans for the building. And Exova said that they believed the plans would have no adverse effect in relation to external fire spread. And an awful lot of weight was placed on those words at the inquiry by the architect's firm and their solicitors um, in in sort of excusing what they did and, and their, their absence of checks. And this is where kind of I'm sure people who've worked on complex construction projects will recognise this thing slipping between the gaps. Exova, when they made that statement, had not actually done any sort of review of the cladding plans. Um, they believed that that would happen later in the job. They didn't think the plans were finalised. So they said, OK, we'll just review it later on down the line. When a design and build contractor came on board, they decided that they didn't need a fire engineer. So they got rid of Exova. And so that that final check that Exova were going to do never happened. Um, but it, Studio E didn't go back and look and see, hey, that final check that Exova were going to do never happened. They just put the emphasis on this line that says no adverse effect in relation to external fire spread. It's a thumbs up. Let's move on. Um, and so that kind of that lack of communication, that kind of siloing within a project, you know, I'm sure it will be familiar to, to, to some people, but it certainly is part of the story here. Um, so Bruce Soans chose, like I said, we, we're talking about a cladding system on an external wall with 
an external facing material, the ACM, a cavity, and then um, some insulation, plastic insulation fixed directly to the wall. Um, I said at the start that it was the, the plastic inside the, the, the external cladding that was the primary cause of the fire, um, but the insulation is not irrelevant. Um, it burnt as well. It didn't. It wasn't the thing that led the, the led the fire to rip all the way up the building so quickly. But it was combustible and it burnt. And when it burnt, it released um, highly toxic, uh, thick black smoke, which which very quickly filled um, the inside of the building. Um, now that that fire um, should never that sorry that um, insulation should never have been used on a high rise building. Um, the regulations weren't perfect, far from it, but they did ban the use of combustible insulation above 18 metres in height unless it's used as part of a system which had passed a large scale test. Grenfell, Grenfell system had never been tested. No system like it had ever been tested. Um, but Bruce Stones was still content to specify um, Celotex FR5000, um, mostly on the basis of the fact that he was aware of it being used on other jobs. Um, uh, he 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 thought that FR stood for for fire resistant. It didn't. It stood for flat roof. Um, and uh, there had been an agreement among various parties on the job that they would um, achieve what they called aspirational U values. They really wanted this to be a very well insulated building. Um, and as a result, they ruled out sort of mineral wall, um, glass wall type insulations, which they didn't think would be able to provide the same insulation performance. They also had kind of access to very um, non-scientific ideas about how safe these materials were. Ideas like it would char rather than burn. Um, and, you know, I hear that stuff still being said about <laughs> insulation products. If you say it to a fire engineer, they laugh you out of the room because charring is part of the burning process. It, it doesn't mean that it's safe, certainly not for a high rise building. Um, and uh Incidentally, I mean, it's worth mentioning because of the call we're on now. Um, it came out in the inquiry that some of the CPD that, that Studio E were doing on the selection of, of products and materials was actually delivered by Celotex. So Celotex is not even technical team, but sales representatives were teaching them how to specify and um, select products. And I mean, if, if, if you can't see the conflict of interest inherent in that, then... Um, uh, there's not much helping you, I'm afraid. Um, so that's the 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 insulation. The, the cladding product is 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 more complicated. Um, that's where we get onto um, two things. One being the low standards of 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 fire regulation in this country, um, because uh, the 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 requirement for external cladding was far too low. Um, and the government should have been aware of that from at least the mid 1990s, but consistently decided not to tighten rules um, to get rid of this outdated standard for for, for cladding panels. And that is, is whatever anyone says and whatever the government lawyer says, that is an absolutely critical reason behind us having so much combustible cladding present on 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 tall buildings in the UK. We used a, an outdated standard called Class Zero, which looks mostly at the surface spread of flame of a material. If you've got something like ACM, it's got aluminium on its surface, and that's a, a non-combustible product which won't burn, but beneath that surface, it's got polyethylene, which is basically petrol. So if you're using a product test which only looks at the surface of a material, you're not going to understand how that's going to perform in a real world fire. And we decided as a country not to tighten standards, despite, you know, and I won't go through them in this presentation, but they are in my book and they're, they're, they're widely available online. Um, this almost constant drumbeat of warnings that we were heading towards a disaster if, if um, we didn't go for a higher standard. Um, so that you you can you know have some sympathy with the architects in that regard because they they, they were looking for a product that was compliant with a standard that um, that was too low and they didn't really have any means of knowing that. However, you also saw evidence that ACM was being very kind of almost nefariously I think pushed into the project. Um, there were relationships between the subcontractor, the product supplier, the company which fabricates it, all of whom stood to benefit financially from the architect specifying this material. And the email chain show that all of them were kind of working together to push 
the architects in the direction of specifying this particular product and this particular brand of a product. And when they finally did, there's this internal email from the, the cladding sales person um, celebrating it by saying, all I can say is you'll be taken out for a very nice meal very soon, somewhere very nice. And that kind of, the architects had no idea that those kind of conversations were happening. They were just talking to the subcontractor and thinking, well, this guy knows what they're talking about. They're probably going to give me good impartial advice about what product to use. But behind the scenes, the subcontractor is having another conversation with a supplier about getting their product onto the job. Um, there's also value engineering, uh, which has become rightly so since Grenfell, a bit of a dirty word in, in, in the construction industry. Um, Bruce Sones, not for reasons of fire safety, but for reasons of aesthetics, originally specified a zinc cladding product, which, which was made of zinc and an aluminium core and was entirely non-combustible. Um, that zinc cladding product, product was taken out of the job and replaced with ACM um, in a value engineering exercise in order to save money. Um, the client had been warned that they hadn't budgeted enough to do this job, um, but they didn't want to reduce the scope of it. Instead, they wanted to, to, to take cost out. And so they looked, they went through the project, I had a value engineering exercise, and they looked at all the areas that cost could be reduced. And one of them was moving from zinc cladding, which cost, um, I think, uh, something like 20 pounds per square meter more than, oh, they might have got that figure wrong because it's come um, from memory from quite a long time ago, but it wasn't, it wasn't a substantial amount of money. The overall saving was about, in the region of 250 to 300,000 pounds from a um, 10 million pound job. Um, but in, in, in cutting the costs in order to protect the profit margin of, of the contractors involved, that was um, almost a no brainer. It was one of the first things that went in their value engineering exercise. Um, I talked about um, aesthetics at the start, um, several ways in which aesthetics help contribute to this tragedy. When Bruce Stones went to the, the, the RBKC planning committee and talked about um, and showed them his designs, they said that they lacked flair and originality. They wanted to see some sort of more, you know, zest in, 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 in his drawings. So he put a crown on top of the building and that crown had no purpose. It didn't insulate anything because there's nothing up there to insulate. It didn't protect from the weather because there's nothing to protect. It was just to add a bit of curve and a bit of flair to, to, to the finished um, facade. Um, in the end, that crown, which was made out of the same ACM as um, the rest of the cladding, plays this extraordinarily tragic and important role in the fire because a lot of cladding fires go up a building in a straight line and then stop when they reach the top because they run out of fuel to burn. At Grenfell, the, the fire went straight up the building in a straight line and hit the crown, which then ignited and took, in the words of one expert, took the flames around the building like a fuse. Um, so you had this lateral fire spread, which ultimately um, encapsulated the whole building. Um, and what's what's particularly tragic about that, and a, this is a, a apology in advance because this is a is a, it's a painful detail. But as uh, lots of people at Grenfell Tower fled upwards because they couldn't go down because the smoke was too too thick below them. And so the the most populated floors in the building were the very top. They were also the highest. Um, hardest for firefighters to reach because they were the furthest from the ground. And because of that crown taking the fire laterally around the building, those were the flats which were first to be involved in the fire, apart from the ones in the um, uh, in the, the sort of central column um, the, the, that were first ignited. And, and lots and lots of the, the 72 victims died in those top flats. Um, so it's this kind of thing of doing something for, for aesthetic purposes, but not thinking through the consequences of it. Um, had 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 awful um, tragic consequences at um, at Grenfell Tower. Um, talking a little bit now, and I'm running slightly behind the time I wanted to, so apologies for rushing slightly through this. Um, but I talked about Celatex and how it was specified for the building, despite it not being compliant. Um, that is true. Um, and when Bruce Stone's test it first chose that product in 2012, there was nothing really to tell him that this was a suitable product for high rise buildings. By the time it was actually added to the, to the construction job in 2014, that, that was less true um, because Celatex had passed a large scale fire test involving their product. 
And they had then gone on to market it for use on high rise buildings. And not only that, they had obtained a certificate from local authority building control saying that it could be viewed as a material of limited combustibility. Now, all of that was wrong. It's been admitted in the inquiry by Celotex witnesses, by LABC witnesses, that um, uh, that that marketing material was false, misleading, and even one of them has called it fraudulent. Um, they they did one large scale test, which uh, paired it with cement fiber cladding panels, um, which are very rarely, if ever, used in in real construction products. Not only that, they um, they reinforced that. Um, those cement fiber products with a magnesium oxide material, which is sort of like asbestos in its fire resistance. Um, so they had uh, uh, effectively testing their um, plastic insulation behind a box of cement and reinforced cement with uh, fire resistant boards. Um, and they didn't declare in their write up of the test that they used those fire resistant boards. Um, that test would have made their product suitable for use on high rise buildings only in the exact replica of the system tested. So only in a building which used cement fiber panels and used magnesium oxide and all those sorts of things. Instead of making that clear to specifiers and architects, they put out um, a marketing material which said on, on the head of every single page, this product is suitable for use on high rise buildings. And architects, I don't necessarily think can, can be, can say certainly can't take all of the blame, for um, believing that and taking it at face value. Um, this is where the horse meat and lasagna quote comes because um, they, uh, one of Neil Crawford, one of the architects involved, said that um, he felt like the insulation was like selling horse meat as beef lasagna. Um, and, uh, you know, um, you, can, you can reach your own conclusions on whether or not you agree with him on that. Um, the, the Renault Bon P55, like I said, um, it was uh, a, the sort of product that could have obtained a class zero rating and could have been used in apparent compliance with the rules. This particular product hadn't actually been tested to class nor. Um, nonetheless, it was marketed as, as having done so um, and having achieved that rating because their fire retardant version of this product had passed that test and they were able to persuade um, the uh, uh, British Board of Agramont or the, the BBA to issue a certificate for the non-fire resistant product on the basis of a test on the fire resistant product. Um, Rayno Bond also had what was, was uh, iconic as, as the company which sits behind that brand is known, had what was described in the inquiry as a dirty, uh, as a deadly secret. In, the, in 2004, they had tested that material in two configurations, one as a flat sheet and the other one bent round into a cassette shape so that it could be hung on rails. They discovered that when you did that, bending it round into a cassette shape, the polyethylene sort of pulled in the bend um, and ignited and caused a much, much bigger fire. I think 12 times as much heat, um, seven times as much smoke uh, and a much faster um, uh, spreading fire. Um, now, at that point, Rayner Bond, Ar Arconic could have withdrawn Rayner Bond from the market and said, it's not safe. We can't, can no longer offer this for use on buildings. They didn't do that. Instead, they used the, the, the rating for the flat sheet product, which was still dangerous, but safer, and just marketed it with that rating and didn't tell the market um, about this risk of bending it into a cassette shape um, and hanging it on rails and, and how that seriously deteriorated its fire performance. Internal emails talked about keeping that deficiency in fire performance, quote unquote, very conf confidential. Uh, the head of technical policy used the phrase we are in the know at one point with regard to the fire risk. Um, they even wrote an internal marketing email speculating about what their, their response would be to a fire which killed 60 to 70 people. Grenfell, of course, killed 72. And that email was written in 2007. So 10 years before Grenfell. Um, the. Um, uh, the um, nonetheless, this product stayed on the market and Grenfell chose that bent cassette shape because of aesthetics. They felt that it looked better because you need to use rivets um, to fix a flat sheet to a building and they can attract rust. And so because of that, to avoid attracting rust, um, the the actually more expensive cassette shape panel was um, 
was used. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll nip through Kingspan quickly. I mean, Kings, there was a small amount of Kingspan K15 on the tower. Um, similarly to um, Celatex, that product was tested um, in certain configurations and then marketed to the, the industry as suitable for use on high rise buildings, full stop. Um, and as a result, became a market leader for high rises, despite in almost all circumstances, not meeting the the, the statutory requirements for um, or statutory guidance re requirements for uh, insulation on high rises. And we have a legacy now of thousands and thousands and thousands of buildings where this material was present and in, in many of them is now having to be removed. Um, so to, to just pull out some key lessons from all that, um, some of which seem fairly self-evident. One is don't take jobs you're not qualified for. I'm sure Bruce and um, Neil Crawford wish that they'd stuck to designing schools. Um, if you are going to do that, or if you even if you're not going to do that, then don't rely on other people in the chain to 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 um, uh, to be the ones who know the rules and check your work. You have to know it for yourself one way or another. You have to at least have a grasp on it. You don't need to be an expert necessarily, but you need to know enough. Um, I would say to to tell the horse meat from the beef lasagna. Um, you need to understand that subcontractors might not be impartial. They might be pushing products for their own ends. Um, even people giving you CPD sessions might have their own agenda, as we saw here. Um, and read certificates. Certificates are written by marketing teams. A lot You will never see the original test report. You won't see the um, the actual data of what happened in, in a fire laboratory. And chances are, unless you're a... Um, uh, a, 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 a very, very, very competent fire engineer, you probably won't know what it means either. What you will see is something produced by a marketing team. And that means you need to look through it with as fine tooth a comb as you possibly can. Um, because the truth about these products was there. It was just right down in the small print <laughs> and difficult questions might have exposed it. Um, and I think just the, 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 the last thing I would say is be unpopular. You know, nobody on the, the, the Grenfell Tower job wanted to be the one who asked a difficult question, who upset the client, who sort of said, actually, maybe we can't save money because we're going to need to do X, Y and Z. Um, but I think in the long run, everyone would have benefited from that unpopular voice. And I think the architects, as 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 the people in this chain who have the kind of pride and the professionalism in, in building safe um, and beautiful buildings are, are probably the best placed to be the difficult and popular ones in a construction job and and, and ask those sorts of questions. Um, so, yeah, I've run over quite heavily, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and see if there's any questions to um, to deal with. That, that's perfectly fine, um, uh, Pete. Um, not, not, not an issue at all. Um, just before we get going into q and I just thought uh, it, it'd be good to obviously uh, just find out uh, just from a sort of very sort of human perspective, just find out obviously this huge tragedy. We lost a lot of lives during this fire. Um, what's the update in regards to where these people are, uh, are living, uh, the people who have survived and so on? Where, where, where is, what, what, what's been sort of the outcome in regards to that? Um, and just a, sort of a general sort of light update in regards to those points before we go into sort of more technical sort of, yeah. sorts of questions. Fine. I mean, the, the rehousing process was long. It was very difficult. Um, it was poorly managed. Um, there was some some really, I mean, there was some really obvious mistakes made. I mean, the, the government sort of thought they could solve the problem by throwing money at it. Um, so they just bought a load of flats in Kensington and said, OK, people from Grenfell, come and live here. We bought you a... But they didn't think about, well, what do people actually need? They need somewhere near their child's school. They need, they might not want to live in a high rise block anymore. Um, and getting the, the right sort of properties was much harder. And then you ended up in a sort of bidding process where traumatized survivors were kind of bidding against one another to, to to get what was seen as the better properties um and that that process was very unnecessarily um long and very unnecessarily traumatic it has kind of come almost to an end now i think everybody um bar bar maybe one or two households are now in a permanent home um most of them still in the borough um some of them um ch choosing to move away um, no one's been forced out. Uh, but I think the community has has really, really, really suffered. I mean, they they, they haven't um, seen justice yet. They, they've been involved in this horrible, lengthy um, legal process. Um, the, the, even the availability of kind of health monitoring um, and and counselling is kind of strictly rationed and, and they're made to kind of prove that they need it. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think the community has been let down, unfortunately, and, and continues to be let down um, and obviously has to process with, with each year, you know, with a kind of dwindling number of people who notice and care this this kind of grief and, and anger that they um, that they're, they're, they're going to hold forever. And, and, and one more before we get into more technical questions is, has there been a plan in regards to what they're going to be doing with the Grenfell building? Um, it's enormously um, contentious that um, there is a there's a sort of community formed the government formed a group from the community to to make decisions. Um, there are very split views. Um, people who live near the tower, for example, some of them, not all of them, but some of the people who live near the tower find it very difficult to have it there every day when they open their curtains. You know, you think children lost their school members you know they, they 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 went to school with their best friend he died in the tower and they, they wake up every morning open their curtains and look at it and so mm. some of them want to see it gone o other people don't want it to go because they think that that would be the ultimate kind of cover-up thing and then there's hugely complicated issues around religious um the religious significance of you know there, there potentially being some kind of physical remains left and it's being a place where people's relatives died and different religions that were, were around have different views on 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 how that should be treated as a result um so it's a very difficult and painful conversation but i think the most important yeah. thing with that is that whatever does happen to it is genuinely a, a decision from the community um Definitely. and not one that's been imposed from outside yes yeah, so obviously deepest deepest dearest condolences to everyone that was sort of suffered from it whether whether sort of directly or indirectly um so now I'll just move on to sort of doing some questions uh, so we've got a question here from jay um are there now any regulations to mitigate the manufacturer sales slash subcontractors etc pushing the sale of non-compliant materials to to uh, professional consultants purely for financial gain um there's there's stuff coming through isn't there i mean there's a construction products regulator um there was some guidance that the government put out um last year on it um i, I have to confess to not being a, a, a complete expert in that area um Certainly, this, it's, a, it's a fairly nascent stage and it's focused around cladding products when I think that th this really points to this happened to be a cladding fire. But the, the issue of inappropriate products being pushed for financial gain is a much bigger problem. Um, and I would I would like to see that. I'd like to see that that construction products regulator given much sharper teeth. I'd like to see trading standards who, who should be policing this stuff anyway, getting really involved in the construction sector. And I'd also like to see the the, the police. I mean, it, 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 fraud is a crime and it doesn't matter if people die or not. If you sell a product that isn't what it says it is, then you, you, you've you committed a criminal offence. And so I, I would like to see those bodies that exist getting much tighter on um, enforcing the existing law as well as bringing new laws in. Um, I don't think enough's happened in that regard. Yeah. I've uh, got a question in from James. Um, what is happening to uh, the residents uh, nearby regarding health monitoring in regards to the toxic gases that were breathed in um not enough in 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 short um they have is one of the major asks that the grenfell survivors and sort of justice groups have had is regular health monitoring for the community um it's never really happened um there, there's been there, there are kind of nhs outreach projects um there are kind of people can go to their go and I'll talk about their concerns but a kind of concerted academic led health monitoring process for because as you say a horrendous amount of um chemical materials breathed in by those who, who fled the tower and by those who live nearby um never been given funding and 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 that, that, that to me is a is an enormous part of the kind of ongoing scandal thank you um we've got a two-part question from taj uh we've got uh we'll probably split it into two actually so what is your opinion on single slash multiple stairs uh making the headlines uh from your perspective um i actually wrote a, a comment piece on this for inside housing last week um uh i, I i'll tell you what i'll send usman i'll send you a, a link to that comment piece so people can can it can go out with my slides if you're going to send an right. email around yeah, that'd be, i think yeah, in, that'd be in very in very brief terms i think that we we are we are switzerland the united kingdom and south korea are the only countries um in the world with with of 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 about 30 or 40 studied that don't have a requirement for second staircases at any height you the key principle of fire engineering as far as i'm concerned is redundancy if 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 one layer of protection fails 
you can't have just a catastrophe as a result. You have to have a backup. And a single stair building has no redundancy. If that stair gets compromised with smoke, there is no way out of the building. And I don't think that's acceptable for new build. Um, I think that the crucial missing part of this is that the government has not really explained what it wants to achieve with second staircases. Do you have one staircase for the firefighters and one staircase for the evacuation? Do you have a single cord building with two stairs, but there's sort of smoke separation between them? You know, what do you what do you do? Do you need lift shafts in both of them? All of those sorts of questions. And because they haven't answered them, that means that it's, it's slowing the design process down. And a lot of projects which would do a lot of good in the world aren't, aren't being built as a result. So what we need from the government is clarity. But I think the, the industry should embrace second staircases because it offers a backup if something goes wrong and Grenfell tells us things can go wrong. Do you feel as though there's other items that uh, with this obviously hitting the headlines, uh, the second staircase, for example, do you feel there's other items that have sort of suddenly fallen into the background? Obviously, there's items regarding uh, the Building Safety Act, which may be covered, but is there anything that you feel as though that's sort of suddenly sort of gone very quiet? Um, not so much suddenly. I think in terms of new build, the regulations are slowly getting to a place where they're they're OK. I mean, like the, we, we, the, the sort of... Um, Combustibles ban, which I know is controversial, but I, I support and um, the imposition of sprinklers from 11 metres. Um, so we kind of went through those two things first and now have got to second staircases, which I think is a legitimate next step. Um, I think that the, the, the big question that's not being answered is, is how do we evacuate a building when everything goes wrong? And that's not just about new build, but it's about existing buildings, too. You know, if compartmentation fails, if the stay put strategy fails, how do you get people, including people with disabilities, out of that building safely? That should be considered when we're building new new buildings because it, it means things like, um, you know, uh, evacuation lifts, potentially. It means um, certainly some form of fire alarm, which we, we don't have a regulation for at the moment. And so I think the that is a question that, that lots of parts of the kind of construction industry and fire sector don't want to engage with because it's very difficult to answer. But the worst thing you can do is just therefore ignore it and not answer it. OK, and the second question was, uh, what are your thoughts on the smoke ventilation system used at Grenfell Tower? The smoke control system was considered non-compliant. Um, sorry, Osman, you might have frozen on me a little bit there. Um, but smoke control um we wrote quite a lot about smoke control again i can send some links to um uh to that content if it's of interest to people um i think the smoke control was important it was it they it, what seems to have been the most significant factor of failure with the smoke control is that it distributed smoke on higher floors so when when um smoke sort of started to spread on the fourth floor rather than taking all of that smoke out of the building it appears to have kind of evacuated smoke at quite an early stage on the, the upper floors, which discouraged people from leaving. And that's a big problem. The smoke control system in, in the tower is, is an issue, but it's not the biggest one because by the time there were fires burning on 24, well, 20 of the 24 stories, no smoke control system in the world is going to cope with that. Um, and so it's, it's only really in the very early stages of the fire that the failure of the smoke control system is relevant. And it is relevant, it's something that should be talked about, but the bigger issues are the cladding, the, the failure of the fire doors, the failure to have an evacuation strategy, really. Great. Um, and then we've got uh, another question in from James. <clears throat> Do you think that the Building Safety Act and recently published secondary le legislation and proposed reforms will ensure that this never happens again? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I think, first of all, because the Building Safety Act really is only, I mean, yes, there are kind of occupied buildings rules. I don't think that, um, uh, I think that what we might be able to get to a point is we can say this will never happen again in a new build, um, touch wood, but the, 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 the only a small fraction of the population will ever live in a new build. Most people will live in buildings that we've already built. And the, the 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 Grenfell was a failure of external cladding, which was slowly taken off, internal defects, primarily fire doors, which we're not really doing that much to fix, and evacuation, and we're not answering that evacuation question. Um, you know, we are also, the other mistake that was made with Grenfell is we, we pushed ahead with cladding technology, 
without allowing regulations to catch up. We said, this is a great new technology. We want to do new things with it. We can insulate our buildings. We can make them more comfortable to live in. And regulation will get in the way of that, so we don't want it. We are still doing that with other innovative construction products, with the use of lightweight timber, with the use of modern methods of construction. They're great things, but you need regulation to go with the innovation to make sure that these buildings are safe. And there have been enough fires now to worry me. Um, and, you know, converting offices to residential properties. Th these are all kind of non-traditional methods of construction where um, they are dangerous if you get them wrong. And we we, we still focus on, on allowing innovation without regulation. Um, and I think that 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 could result in in dangerous buildings because it did here. OK, um, and I know you I know you've basically been touching on this, but uh, there's a question from Mike. Uh, I've missed out the bit that covers the previous question. But what are your thoughts on about how this legislation is evolving with time? Uh, obviously, it's, it's something that's taken, like you said, a number of years in regards to sort of researching and understanding the Building Safety Act, secondary legislation, etc. Yeah. But how do you feel like it's evolving with time? I think like. To make a very broad point and like because there's obviously there's so many elements to the building safety act and a new regime some of which are really good some of which aren't so good um but as a kind of broad philosophical point i think the mistake the government's made is they have viewed grenfell and the cladding crisis as purely an issue of competency they 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 said it, this was a mistakes by incompetent people and if we can make sure that people are competent and we can make sure that the golden thread is respected and um information is passed from through all of the, the building safety gateways from one person to another, then this 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 won't happen again. And that's sort of true. But the other side to it is you need good regulation in the first place, because if you don't have good rules, then even very competent people won't follow them. And so the Building Safety Act puts all of the emphasis on the individual and the, the, the people on the building site and the responsible person to say, here is your responsibility to make buildings safe. It doesn't turn back to the state and say, well, actually, what's our responsibility as a, as a legislator and as a regulator to make sure that the rules that we put in place are correct? And part of the reason for that is that this was developed at a stage before the Grenfell Tower inquiry had exposed all of this kind of this sea of deregulation that led to the fire. And the government was very keen on presenting it as a failure by individual um, construction professionals instead of a failure of government. Um, and so I think Dame Judith Hackett's review and the Building Safety Act, which followed it, do quite a good job of kind of forcing people to take responsibility and be compliant. And there's some, you know, bits that need to be worked out. But what it doesn't do is say, well, actually, if the government's going to keep cutting red tape and keep removing rules and keep refusing to impose restrictions on industry, you're still not going to get safety. Um, and, you know, I think philosophically, that's something that, that we need governments to, to change their mind on as well as just asking us as professionals to be more um, more uh, competent and, and to talk to each other more. Great. Um, so we'll bring it to a close there. Um, what I'll do is I'm just going to take over and share the screen. Um, naturally, thank you ever, ever so much for coming along and uh, doing this uh, bespoke talk for us um, as building professionals um, on such a sensitive subject um, which is obviously a national tragedy tragedy um, so that was a talk from peter apps uh, of inside housing uh, on how we let grenfell happen uh, that was our september event for cpd in 43 um, just to run through the next few events up until the end of the year uh, so we have an event on the 11th of October uh, from a UK government security advisor protecting the physical and digital engineered world. Our uh, November event is on the 15th of November, uh, which is inclusive design, common and less well-known issues. And then the final event, just to close off the year, uh, will be on the 6th of de December, uh, which is from Weiner Berger, technical considerations when designing with brick. We do have, um, uh, qu quarter one already uh, scheduled um, and those that marketing material etc will be published in due course um, so we have another three events already booked in uh, for the 2024 calendar if you do have any suggestions in regards to 
topics or events that you guys would like to have presented as part of the CPD in 43 series, please do reach out to me. Um, I'm more than happy and open ears to uh, make sure that we've got a wide um, and engaging uh, topic. Um, so please do let me know. Um, as Pete, Peter has indicated, he will be sending across a couple of links that we will loaded to YouTube. Thank you again to Peter um, and thank you for everyone to, who, have, who has attended today um, and hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you.